Amen. God is so good. So we're going to look at Jonah 2, uh, 117, which this is the last verse of Jonah. And, and then I, I know, because I was looking at my notes here, so I, I know I already messed that uh, second up. That's Jonah 2, 1 there. Uh, but I, I, I wanted to combine these together. So now the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And then we'll go to Jonah 2, 1 there. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. Amen. Let's ask the Lord to help us today. Can we, Heavenly Father? You're so good, and we love you, and we thank you for your presence we feel here. We thank you for the great worship we've enjoyed to this point in time. And now, Lord God, again, we just ask you to bring every thought into captivity for a few moments today. In Jesus' name. One more time, put your hands together before you sing. You may be seated today. God is great. My title this morning is simply prayer. Prayer. Tuesday and Wednesday, September 1 and September 2, we've asked for you to take a prayer shift. And uh, you, can, you, you can still take a prayer shift, right? Even if somebody's got a, a time slot taken, you can pray that time. Uh, or if there's a time slot that's not on the list and you want to pray, pray. But I also, I didn't know this, but, uh, you know, when I make the calendar, I put on the on the calendar the quarterly times of praying and fasting. So this has been on our calendar since last September, October, for this particular uh, uh, week. I, the only thing I've done was because of the coronavirus, we moved it from, usually it was Wednesday, Thursday, with Thursday night prayer, we're going Tuesday, Wednesday, with Wednesday night prayer. But I said, I said this, I've been seeing some things on social media that there's a call to prayer for the month of September for our nation. And uh, I would just simply say this, during your prayer shift, and in your prayer shift, you can sing songs, you can read your Bible, you can offer petitions to God, you can enter into praise and thanksgiving, right? You can pretty much take 60 minutes and divide it up and, and conquer that 60 minutes relatively easy. But I would strongly suggest that in that prayer shift, that we all, on our individual times, amen, and then when we come together virtually on Wednesday night, September 2nd, 7.30, I would say that we all pray for America. Yes. We all pray for America. Amen. And uh, for, you know, uh, Sirius XM was uh, offered a free, I don't know if it was a 30-day or 30-day trial or six months trial or anything. Anyway, both of our vehicles are equipped with uh, satellite radio, and but you know I don't I won't pay for the subscription. But uh, they offered a free 30-day, 60-day, whatever it was trial. So I signed up both cars to get Sirius XM radio because there's one station on Sirius XM that I really love to listen to, and you'll probably never guess in a million years what it is, but it's called the 40s Junction. It's from the 1940s, the big band era, and I love listening to that particular era of style of music. And uh, I think it's channel 73 on Sirius XM. And so both, and my wife yesterday, because you, know, you have those presets on the car, I preset her car, <laughs> and she goes, wait a minute, that's my car, right? And uh, what are you setting Sirius XM on that one for that? But anyway, I love listening to that. And here's what I'm saying about this. Coming off of World War II, the greatest generation, that 1945 era, and you get past World War II, and, and there's some here that and associated with the church could remember that, but that would be like, to me, it would seem like it was a sweet spot in American history, right? Industry was ramped up. The country was going good. It was coming off victory. If those people could be transported today and see where we're at, yeah, yeah. the 40s and the 50s, that decade, maybe 45 to 55, uh, if you could transport those people, those leaders, how about this? If you could transport those people that defended freedom coming off of that massive war where millions of people were killed, and you could bring them and put them in 2020, what would they think about the condition of our country compared to them? 
And again, we need to pray. And here's the thing that we are looking at is that we've called ours to prayer and there's those 30 days of prayer that is now being trumpeted on social media, Pray for America. We, we need America to, to be prayed for. Not, not just in a patty cake fashion. We need intercessory prayer for the United States of America today. Right, right. We need people to get serious about praying for our country. And not just in 30 days of September, but we need to pray for America today. How about if we just do that right now in our congregation this morning? Heavenly Father, we're going to pause right here and we're going to pray for our country. Lord God, our country needs you more than anything. Lord God, more than anything, you are the answer. I hear an old song that says, Jesus is the answer for the world today. And I believe that so true this morning. God, help our country. Help all the strife and the division. Lord God, that's occurring. God, let us see unity. Let us see healing. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Man, so when you pray on your prayer shift Tuesday or Wednesday, pray for America. Amen. The Bible said that righteous people exalt the nation. Let me say it again. The Bible says that righteousness exalts a nation. Yeah. Amen. And we need to lift our country up in prayer. We need to lift our church up in prayer. We need to lift saints up in prayer. Amen. We need to pray together. Amen. Uh, I taught a couple of Wednesday nights ago on the topic was called continually praying. I used the scripture in there from James 5, 16 through 18. I'm going to use it again right now. It said, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another. Amen. We need to entertain prayer for each other rather than gossiping about each other. Can I get an amen right there? Amen. amen. We need to pray for each other rather than criticize each other. James, the brother of the Lord, has given us a specific command when he says, pray one for another. He said, also pray that ye may be healed. He would go on to say, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Verse 18, and he prayed again, amen, and the heaven gave rain and the earth brought forth her fruit. How many know the day that the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much? I believe that this morning. I, I, and here's what I believe about this today. I believe that prayer is answered, whether it's answered the way we want it or not, God does hear his people, yeah. and he does answer prayers yeah. today. Yeah. Amen. And when we get busy about praying, the effectual, fervent prayer, amen. When we get serious about prayer, and, uh, and we, get, we get focused about praying, and not just in times of crisis, not just when pastor calls for it, amen. But again, I cannot emphasize and say enough that we, as Christians, we need to develop our own time of devotion when we're spending time with God praying. I also believe that praying includes listening to what God is saying as well. It's not all about talking. Sometimes I think it's good, maybe if you got a prayer shift for one hour, call about, call about five minutes where you're just going to shut your mouth, uh, shut your mind, and just try to hear what God is saying to us to me, to you at this point in time. So I believe that prayer involves listening as well. Amen. But I would just encourage us as Christians that we develop a time of prayer and we pray. And again, I'm not going to teach and preach that from what I did a few Wednesday nights ago, but we need to be in perpetual prayer in this season of life that we find ourselves in today. Amen. I, 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 I just want to say this right now. Uh, I believe a lot of Bible prophecy is being fulfilled right in our very lives today. Today, around the world, we're seeing Bible prophecy fulfilled. And as I was thinking about coming into this service today, trying to meditate this week and give some time 
to just allowing God to speak to me as to what I would say this morning. I felt impressed to speak on prayer because we are praying Tuesday, Wednesday. But I also was impressed very distinctly by God to examine Jonah and uh, to examine not just the story of this man who was uh, fleeing from the presence of the Lord, right? God called him to go to Nineveh and the Bible said that he paid the fare to flee from the presence of the Lord, right? He made a conscious choice. I'm not talking about that, nor am I talking about the fact that he was commissioned to preach at Nineveh. Although those are great stories, right? That he preached to Nineveh. But as I was thinking about this, and I had to go back and I had to read the book of Jonah in preparation for this message. The entire second chapter, or, or most of it anyway, there are 10 verses in the second chapter. And outside of verse 1, which I shared with you when it said that he prayed to God, and outside of verse 10, when it talks about the fish vomiting him up on the, uh, on the, on the uh, seashore, those eight verses from 2-2 two, two to 2-9, two, uh, those verses are Jonah's prayer. They're Jonah's prayer. Jonah prayed a prayer. And God impressed this upon me for this service this morning. That we should, for just a minute, examine the prayer of Jonah. Amen. Because Jonah was a man that was used by God. Now, let me tell you something about Jonah. There, the, Jonah was used by God to prophesy. Amen. I've got yellow notes and I got white notes today. But in Jonah, in Jonah's life, he served under the 14th king of Judah. He served under Jeroboam the second. You remember when Solomon uh, passed from this life, the kingdom was split between Rehoboam and Jeroboam, right? right, right. So Jeroboam the second, a descendant down line, 14th king later, we find that Jonah is a prophet in Jeroboam's life. Not only did he prophesy to Jeroboam, but he prophesied in 2 Kings 12.45, I believe it is, 2 Kings 12.45, he prophesies, Jonah, to the entire nation of Israel that God is going to restore their borders. He was mightily used by God. And sometimes it's lost because all we focus on is the, jo the book of Jonah. We don't realize that he's mentioned in other places, that he's mentioned in 2 Kings uh, 12.45, how that he prophesied to the entire nation and to Jeroboam that God was going to restore the borders of Israel. Not only that, but Amos, a contemporary, and Hosea, contemporaries of Jonah, reference his experience. Reference not the experience of him prophesying about the borders being restored, but they reference his experience going to Nineveh. And they reference his experience of, of, of being in the belly of the well, as the Bible calls it, for three days. Amen. In fact, uh, who is it? Is it Hosea who starts out in 1 1 and says, The burden of Nineveh, the entire book of Hosea, I believe it is, is written about Nineveh. So some believe that, that the book of Jonah is just an allegory, but it is not. It really happened. And Jesus himself in the New Testament referenced Jonah at least on two different occasions. Amen. And so we have to understand that Jonah uh, and uh, this probably the experience of the book of Jonah is probably later in his life, actually. But we see that Jonah was a man used by God. Right. He had a connection with God and he prophesied to a king who was wayward. That Jeroboam, too, continued in the worship of calves and false idols and golden gods and, and the groves and things of that nature. And Jonah was sent by God to try to correct a wayward king and to tell a wayward nation that, that God was going to restore. Aren't you thankful that God has a voice, amen, in the lives of people? I, I just want to say this, and I know, I'm, I know that this may or may not wind up on social media platforms and content, but I want to say this. Our friend Tony Suarez uh, uh, just this week was part of the people that were invited to the White House to hear President Trump's acceptance speech. Uh, what was that? Thursday night. Uh, and and I'm, I'm going to say this. 
this is not an endorsement. This is not uh, saying one thing or another. I'm just saying this. I have seen multiple pictures of people around our president praying for him. Right. Amen. And, and I can say this as well with a sure fact. I know that when President Clinton was in office, people were around him praying of the apostolic persuasion as well. I'm thankful, whether it be President Clinton and if there's others in between, I don't know. But I'm thankful that President Trump, President Clinton, that these men have allowed other people of, of apostolic persuasion and other denominations to come to the Oval Office and to pray for them. Right, right. Amen. And no matter what happens in November, I pray, amen, that there is still that mentality that the Oval Office can be a place of prayer in our country today amen. and going forward. And I am thankful that throughout the Bible we see people that were used by God, prophets and preachers and, and handmaidens of the Lord, that had influence with leaders and rulers and kings and was able to pray for them. Amen. That's what we need to do in our country. And I'll go back to that right now. What we need to do for our country is we need to pray for every leader in high office. We need to pray for the Supreme Court uh, justices. We need to pray for our governors. We need to pray for our mayors. The Bible tells us specifically to pray for those that are in leadership. Pray for those that are in authority. Pray for those that are rulers. Amen. We can get on social media and cut them up left and right, but have we prayed for them? Come on. Amen. And we find here in the Bible, a heathen king had a spiritual voice in his life. Amen. A nation that was backslidden had a voice in its life. And I say we as evangelical Christians, we need to rise up. Amen. And we need to declare that we're praying for our country. We're praying for our leaders. Amen. And that the Bible way is the right way. It's the godly way. And if our nation will follow God in the Bible, we will see blessings poured out. In the United States of America today. Amen. Jonah. Let's go back to this. Jonah is called by God. Now I'm going to. I want you to stay with me. Because I like these. I like picking out these things in scripture. To help us think. Jonah 1 and 2 starts out this way. Arise. Go to Nineveh. That great city. And cry against it. This is what God says to him. Arise. Everybody say Arise. He said, arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. All right? So this is what we have. We have God telling him to arise and to go cry against it. Then I read for you Jonah 2.1, where it said that he was in the belly of the well for three days. That verse starts out, then, right? Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord. Arise, cry. Then pray. Then when you get to Jonah 3, amen, and 1, and the word of the Lord came into Jonah the second time. Everybody said the second time. Yes. Saying, arise, it's almost verbatim. Go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it. Did you catch the change? Genesis, uh, Jonah 1, 1, he says, arise, go cry against it. Then Jonah prays. 3-1, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it. Do you know that there is a great difference in the meaning of the word against and unto, contextually right here? Yep. When he is saying cry against or preach unto, it's two different things. Because in the first instance, God is sending Jonah to tell them that if they don't repent, that he's going to destroy them. That's, that's simply what it is. But then by Jonah 3.1, what changes? Does God change? Does Jonah change? Does the message change? Something happened. But God says now, go preach unto those people. And so now he's no longer coming from condemnation and hellfire damnation. But now he's saying, preach unto them. Now I want to give you just a little insight here. When I research those words, cry versus preach, they're the same word in the ancient text. They mean the exact same thing. It's a proclamation. He had, he had been commissioned by God on both occasions to go and proclaim repentance. Everybody said repentance. Well, oh, come on. That was weak. Repentance. repentance. There you go. And so we find that he is to proclaim this. 
But now instead of coming against them, he's coming unto them. Amen. He's coming as a peer. Why? Because Jonah sinned. And Jonah was judged. Come on, think about it. Jonah spends time. So the writer's point of view, POV, the writer's perspective changer. There are people that feel that Jonah penned this later in life, after the events. And we can see his change in attitude because of his own transgression. Come on. Come on. We can see his change in his thought process. It, before his own sin, before his own transgression, he was going to go point a bony finger, amen, at a group of people and condemn them to damnation. But after his own trend, who, who can sit in the seat of judgment today? When he comes out of the belly of the well with seaweed and puke all over him, he marches into the city saying, well, really, I'm an equal to you because I am a sinner. And now I'm no longer preaching at you or coming against you, but I'm preaching unto us, unto us as equals and peers. Amen. That we all need the mercy and the grace of God in our life today. Put your hands together and magnify the Lord. <laughs> Jameson Fawcett Brown commentary, as I was reading some commentaries on, on Jonah 1, uh, I, I like what they said about him leaving and getting on a boat and paying the fare to flee from the presence of the Lord. Here's what Jameson Fawcett Brown commentary says. Fleeing from imaginary evils, we fall into real and fatal ones. Oh, here's the problem with Jonah fleeing. Nineveh was the capital of the Gentile and the Assyrian world. If you remember, the king of Nineveh came down when Hezekiah was the king. And he said, we've destroyed all the nations around you. And he told the people in their own tongue. He told the Jews in their own tongue. He said, he, the king said this. He said, don't listen to Hezekiah. Hezekiah is not going to be able to deliver you. But you know what? God did deliver them from the king of Assyria. And the Bible said that the king of Assyria went back to Nineveh. And when he went into the temple to worship his God, his own two sons killed him, assassinated him, right? And, and done away with him. And, and, and they eliminated him. And so Nineveh, this great city, uh, Jonah was afraid to go there because they were the mortal enemies of the Jews. He was afraid to go there because if they were spared, he knew that things were going to happen. Now, the end of the story is, is that 200 years after Jonah, Nineveh was destroyed. 200 years later, uh, the, the Chaldees and Medes came in, I think it was, and they destroyed them. But, but, but I thought Jameson Fawcett Brown commentary was very enlightening. Fleeing from imaginary evils, we fall into real and fatal ones. Our safety, as well as our duty... Is to leave future events in God's hands and to give ourselves unholy to be unholy, not meaning unholy, H-O-L-Y, but W-H-O-L-L-Y. In other words, we're going to give ourselves entirety to be his instruments, to do by us and with us as he wills. <laughs> we don't control tomorrow, friends. We don't control the election on November 3rd, friends. We need to just put it all in God's hands. And we need to move forward. Amen. And obey him. Let's look at Jonah's prayer. And uh, I broke these down into bite sizes. So that we can just kind of look at it. I'm going to expound just a minute on these. And Jonah 2.2 is where his prayer starts. And, and it talks about him. This is Jonah now. I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord. And he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I, thou heardest my voice. Powerful, powerful. He's, say, he's likening what's going on to an affliction. He's, he's saying that he has descended to the lowest parts, yet God heard him. Next slide is Job 2, 3 and 4. For thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas. Now we remember this, right? He was thrown overboard by seasoned sailors. And... This giant fish was prepared by God to swallow him. Interesting, again, as I was studying this, I read commentary. When he's talking about this, some commentaries would argue. And again, this is, 
this is just this is just good conversation. It's not gonna it's not heaven or hell, right? Whatever you believe. But there are some commentators that felt that he actually sank all the way to the bottom of the ocean before the well or the big fish swallowed him. And this is what he's saying here. Thou hast cast me into the deep. In the midst of the seas, the floods come past me about. Thy billows and waves pass over me, right? So there are some that argue here in this, on this scripture that he literally sank to the very bottom of the ocean before that fish swallowed him. Others would contend that the minute he was thrown overboard, he was swallowed. And now he's describing being in the belly of that great fish. And again, this is not a heaven or hell. I just thought it was interesting because this pastor, this preacher... I've always made the assumption as soon as they threw him overboard, he got swallowed, right? And again, it makes no difference, but I thought it's interesting because it does, when you read the prayer, he's going, I'm drowning, I've been thrown overboard, not only am I fleeing the presence of the Lord, but now I'm going to die, I'm sinking to the bottom, right, of the water here. And, and let's go ahead and, and go to the next slide where he says in Jonah 2.5, the waters compassed me about. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. And again, I'd always assume that he's talking from his experience within the belly of that great fish. Commentators here, some that I studied, said no, that this was actually because he was at the bottom. He's on the ocean floor. And this is what he experienced before that well swallowed him. I went down to the bottom of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee into thy holy temple. Amen. He came to his senses. Amen. When he was, when he was in the belly of that well, he realized that God had called him. He realized that his life had been spared, and he knew that he had to go and preach to those people in Nineveh. Amen. A city was dependent on that preacher. One voice coming into that particular, amen, into that particular uh, city and, and going there. John, Jonah 2 and 8. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. Verse 9. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that. I have vowed salvation. Is of the Lord. Now, I want you to notice something about this prayer. In this prayer, not, there is not one time that Jonah makes a petition to God. He does not make one prayer request to God in this entire prayer. Not one time does he make a prayer request. It is all about what has happened. And then he closes it by saying, I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. Amen. He closes that out by saying, I'm going to pray. Uh, I'm going to give you praise and thanksgiving under your great and matchless name. And so we find then that Jonah goes to this great metro area. And uh, go ahead and put slide eight up. It is Jonah 3 and 4. Jonah, when he enters into the city, Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So we have an entire chapter, chapter 2, given to the prayer of Jonah, but only eight words. Yet 40 days in Nineveh shall be overthrown. Eight words that saved a metro area. Eight. Eight. Remember, this goes back to what I spoke about in our Bible study a couple weeks ago online. How that, the, in, uh, ain't, those ancient commentaries I was reading, they said that, that God hears the short prayers as much as he hears the long prayers. <laughs> God also hears the short messages as much as he hears the one hour messages. And this man walks in with eight words. And we're going to get to this in a minute. But let me talk to you about Nineveh. How significant was Nineveh? Significant enough that let me give you some statistics about Nineveh. Nineveh in particular is a word that identifies one city. But it also is a word that identifies a metro area of four cities. There are four cities in the metro area of Nineveh. And so they are all joined together by that word. That city was 60 miles, or those four cities, 60 miles in circumference. It took him three days to walk that city and preach. Because it was such a large city. I want this to impact us right now. 
60 miles circumference. Walking that city. It took him three days to preach. What did he preach? He preached those eight same words all over the city, I believe. Because there's no record he preached anything else. He just kept saying, 40 days, and none of them shall be overthrown. 40 days. You got 40 days to clean your act up, or you're going to be overthrown. For three days, he preaches that message. He walks it. It's 60 miles. It's a four-city metro area. And let me say this about that. There were 600,000 in population, evidently. But other commentators say that there could have been as many as, many as 2.5 million people in that four-city complex. Two? That'd be like the St. Louis metro area just about, right? Think of that. This is what one man commissioned by God was doing. And he had to go get himself right first. He had to get his attitude right. He had to get everything straightened out. So how big are we talking about? Let's just go back to the 600,000 population. How many's ever been to Memphis, Tennessee? How many ever been to Nashville? Anybody ever been to Denver, Colorado, maybe? We've got some hands going up there. How about Louisville, Kentucky? Anybody been to Louisville, Kentucky? Got a few hands going there. Anybody ever been to Baltimore? So here's the last one I'm going to ask you. And, and you can be honest. We'll, we'll still be saved. How many's ever been to Vegas? <laughs> Guess what the population of about all those cities are? Right about 600,000. Right about 600,000 population. That's the kind of... Now, when, when I found out that Vegas had 600,000, I'm going like, oh yeah, I could really see Nineveh, Vegas. Nineveh, Vegas, right? <laughs> Jonah walks in. So, so if you know anything about Vegas, and you know that Nineveh was so full of debauchery, God was fed up and going to destroy it. So let's just equate what was going on in Nineveh to what was going on in current day Vegas. The debauchery, the filth. And of course, it's in a very American city, but Vegas is known as Sin City. <laughs> and God bless all of our church planners and pastors in the Vegas area. But this is what he's called to. This is the population. This is the environment he's called to. And immediately, immediately, the king of Nineveh gets wind of this. And he tells everybody, we're going to get in sackcloth and ashes. And we're going to repent. And we're going to fast. And we're going to pray. And he said, not just going to be us, the human beings, but even the animals. Everybody. I want to tell you why. Again, I know we, we can focus on different things as I have when we read scriptures and stories in the Bible. But Jonah, when he got himself right, he saved the metro area of, of let's just say, 600,000 people. And for 200 more years, they were able to survive because one man prayed. He prayed for himself. He repented. He got himself lined up. And then he marched in. And he saved the metro area. I've come to tell us this morning that when we get ourselves right as an individual and as a church, we can make an impact. Amen. And grace will abound where sin does abound also. Grace will much more abound right. where sin is abounding if we can get it right. Now, Jesus said this about Jonah in Luke 11 and 30. Jonah was a sign unto the Ninevites. That struck me. And, and I, I tried to research it, but I couldn't find an answer. So I'm just going to give you my divine unction. Somebody in Nineveh was looking for an answer. Somebody in Nineveh was fed up. Somebody in Nineveh wanted God to intervene and change their situation. Because Jesus said Jonah was a sign. I don't know. I've heard stories. I've not researched it myself. But I've heard that when people. And, and there have been modern day experiences of people being swallowed by fish. And, and when they get them out, they're bleached white. Now, I don't know if that's what Jonah looked like. I don't know if... <laughs> I don't know what he looked like after being vomited up after three days on the beach and walking into that city. I don't know if he cleaned himself up. I don't know if he had permanent changes to his skin, his hair, because of that experience. 
But this man was, Jesus said he was a sign. Now, I know we can go that he was a sign like Jesus was in the, in the earth for three days, right? Jonah was in the belly. But this kind of stood out to me parenthetically. Jonah was a sign to the Ninevites. What were they looking for? What were they seeking after that when he stepped in there, one man could impact 600,000 people? Right. He was a sign. Was the king praying for an answer? Was leadership praying for an answer? Was there a group of citizens that was uh, discussing among themselves that their city needed to change? Their neighborhood needed to change? Because Jonah, Jesus, and again, I'm, I know I might be like, boom, pulling that out for all those who might see this online and want to critique it. But I'm telling you that Jesus said Jonah was a sign to the Ninevites. When he walked through the gates of that city, there were some people looking, looking for an answer. And he began to tell them, we need to repent. We need to repent. And we need to get this taken care of. Amen. And we need to see the hand of the Lord. Amen. The hand of the Lord. And so this goes back to what I shared at the outset. That the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Prayer changes things, friends. Don't enter into this. 24 hours of praying as ho-hum, we're just signing up, it's an obligation, we're pacifying the pastor, we're going to do our little Christian duty, why don't we get on our face and first of all get ourselves right with God and then secondly ask God to help us make an impact in our family, in our neighborhood, in our city, in our church, in our metro area, because somebody, just like Jonah was assigned to the Ninevites, Somebody might be looking for an answer. Right. And when you show up, oh God, let the words of my mouth be acceptable in thy sight. Let, let me, what does the scripture say? Let me be, be ready to offer every man a reason of hope. Right. Let me be that reason of hope. In a world today that seems so hopeless and out of control. Stand with me this morning.